When I type help I accidentally into the Google search bar, one of the predicted suggestions is help I accidentally joined the Russian Mafia. Now if that isn't relatable, I don't know what is. When I was a kid, one of my mates was Italian and his dad wore this beautiful bespoke suit with a fedora and everything. He looked like a stereotypical Mafia member. I mean, he was an investment banker who drove a lime green Ford Fiesta, but still, he was my Don Corleone. My friend and his dad, who let's be honest, were probably both secretly Italian gangsters, inspired my love for the sophisticated underground world of organized crime. They were bad people, but they were bad people in great suits who inspired fun games. In Mafia 3, we play as Lincoln Clay. His story is a little different from the first two games, but offers an interesting perspective into 1968 New Orleans. We're immediately thrown into a bank heist that's already taking place. My mate tells me to go and get the armored truck key from the back room. There's a body on the floor and someone tied to a chair with a hood on their head. This is exactly how I lost my virginity. I pick up the body, but the game has different controls and instead of dropping him, I accidentally eliminate the guy sitting down. Blood and brain stains are difficult to get out of cotton shirts, I assume. I throw the body into an alligator cage and to my delight, he gets instantly eaten. We climb into the armored truck and head for the Federal Reserve in our new disguises. It's a scenic drive and we almost die only a handful of times because I put the driving setting on simulation mode but refuse to adapt. We knock on the door and they let us right in. The 60s was a simpler time. It was easier to infiltrate a bank than for a woman to get a credit card from one. They make Lincoln carry all of the bags for one pretty obvious reason. He's really strong and aesthetically built. Also, they're filthy racists. I make my way through the building, and when the moment's right, we stealthily incapacitate the guards. Kidding, Lincoln proceeds to slam this man's head in a furnace so that he's not only injured from the impact, but also so his face is covered in third degree burns. At least his family will surely get a discount if he ends up needing to be cremated. We take down several more guards and gain access to the vault full of cash. The game then changes our time period to the present day because gamers love stopping midway through an invigorating bank heist to instead be picked up from the airport by their stepbrother. Lincoln just got back from fighting in the Vietnam War and bro still makes him drive. We arrive back at Sammy's Bar, which is the headquarters for our organization and perhaps the most depressing place you could have a pint in the world. I receive a warm welcome from our adopted father, Big Sammy and the lads, and then head down to my bedroom. I use the word bedroom conceptually. It's actually more of a dark, disturbing dungeon that makes exploring the hostile Vietnamese coochie tunnels look like a quest for redstone and diamonds. In the morning, I head down to the soup kitchen to feed those in need. It looks like we're serving up pumpkin soup, but we're not even bothering with crusty bread on the side. What homeless people lack in homes, they make up for in sophisticated food palettes. Tomorrow, we best be breaking out the sourdough. Lincoln drops a little soup kitchen riz on this cutie, but then members of the Haitian mob roll in and demand we pay up. Boys, this is a breadless soup kitchen. I'm not going to tell you how to be criminals, but this was a bad shout. Sammy is like, Oi, can you go and kill those dodgy Haitian malakas? And Lincoln's like, I never mentally left Vietnam, Papa Smoke. And then my stepbrother walks in looking zesty. The best way to take down the Haitian mob is by infiltrating their river fortress with an airboat. I swim through the same swamp we fed an alligator and adult human male corpse to, which shows a real lack of critical decision making. I work my way through the Haitian mob soldiers with ease. They almost all face the exact opposite direction of where I'm coming from, just like when I used to try and pick up girls in bars. Unlike the girls, this lot will actually be sore tomorrow. I do shoot a few just to keep Lincoln's Vietnam killstreak alive, he's too often nuke. Sometimes they don't actually die though, they just writhe in pain, and you have to choose whether to mercy kill them or not. I kick down the church door and gun down the Haitian mob leader. I think the other underground organizations will think long and hard before they roll up on our soup kitchen again. This woman comes out of nowhere and she says she's being held against her will and runs to her freedom, hopefully via a waterproof makeup store. As I leave, more Haitian gang members open fire, but fortunately my stepbrother arrives to save me. He proceeds to hop out of the driver's seat. Like, dude, we're in a massive rush and Lincoln just murdered a few dozen people. Maybe he just wants to chill in the passenger seat for a second and listen to some Enya. I proceed to leave him behind so that he can grow as a person. I drive back to Sammy's as the sun rises. This is the first time I've properly been able to explore the bar itself. It doesn't take 10 years of hospitality experience to know that clean tables are good for business. I guess gangsters are above sweeping the floor now too. It's really quite bad, some of the urinals aren't even attached to the wall. Maybe if we spent less time giving wristies to the homeless and more time running this bar properly, we wouldn't even have to commit any crimes at all. Sammy says I need to go and meet with the Marcano Mafia family as we're massively in debt to them. I drive over to their estate and I'll admit it's nicer than our bar. The broken urinals on their floor are probably plated with 24 karat gold. Like the video, if this fancy water fountain inspires you to drink some of God's precious nectar so you're happy and hydrated. 
The Sal Marcano, the big boss, is like, Oi Lincoln, you well hung commando, how do you feel about robbing the Federal Reserve for me? And just like that, we're back in the bank vault. The gamers love unnecessarily jumping between time periods, just ask any Assassin's Creed fan how much they enjoy leaving the Animus. Some associates of ours have drilled through the floor so that we can escape. They just need a little time to finish, so hopefully nothing happens between then and now that could trigger Lincoln's wartime PTSD. The bank cuts the power, and I proceed to unload an M16 machine gun as guards aggressively push our position. That's actually a red hot tip. You can't get PTSD if you never leave the traumatic environment. I need to start speaking at schools. They use C4 to explode the vault, and it falls into the sewer below. I can't help but wonder why we risked prison time and killed 50 guards via infiltrating the building if we could have just done this the whole time. We escape in speedboats, but the police have their entire 15 strong water fleet ready and waiting in the sewers because why wouldn't they? I don't think they've taken into account the response time these units would realistically take to reach this isolated location. My immersion is shattered. We manage to escape via a sick stunt. Using a manhole, we climb to the surface so that we can blend into the busy streets of the Mardi Gras celebrations and avoid the searching police. Mardi Gras has everything you'd expect it to have. Straight couples lovingly staring into each other's eyes and giant Atlantic blue marlin fish parade floats. The good news is, no one is questioning why I'm carrying around a dying man, as that would be homophobic. While ducking through a bar, I see four people passed out in a bathroom. There's a metal spoon on the ground, so I guess they all had crippling muesli addictions. The police are everywhere, but to be honest, their red and blue lights and police uniforms only add to the vibe. We reach our getaway car just in time with three out of the four original heist members, which is pretty good. A 75% survival rate, you take those odds every day of the week. Perhaps we could have picked a car with a roof and even tinted windows so we weren't immediately recognised as we try to flee the area, but I respect the number one rule of being a gangster in the 60s. Fashion before function. I proceed to lose the cops by launching myself off the freeway and barrel rolling through a tree. Finally, something actually realistic happens, I'm fully immersed again. We drive home kings. There's loads of money to be shared, and finally things are looking up for the soup kitchen mafia. Sal Marcano, the big Don himself, even comes to join the celebrations, and then him and his boys kill me. Wow. They then kill all my friends and family members. Mafia families are really mean. We obviously survive the point-blank gunshot wound to the head, and are nursed back to health by a Catholic priest. We spend months recovering in the church. We are perfectly safe here, because we're not a 13-year-old boy. I will also say that our new church home is objectively a lot more homely than the dungeon at Sammy's Bar. All those tithing payments were obviously spent on a state-of-the-art 14-inch TV and an interior decorator because this holy palace is ice cold. If you brought a girl back to Sammy's, she'd run for her life. If you brought a girl back here, you could get lit on the sacramental wine, have premarital relations, and then ask for forgiveness all within three or four minutes. My mate John Donovan and I head out to assess the damage. John's a CIA agent that Lincoln worked with back in Vietnam, and now they're best friends forever. John's determined to help us get revenge on the Marcanos. We arrive at Sammy's bar, and it's been burnt to the ground. This would be so deeply saddening for Lincoln, as he was raised here. John Donovan proceeds to drive off. My whole family was just murdered, and this is the first time I'm visiting the scene. Some emotional support from my only living friend would have been welcomed. I enter the venue, and it honestly doesn't look that different. Perhaps even better. Lincoln keeps having visions of everyone's final moments. He's making a bit of a meal of it. I thought orphans were meant to be tough. This already happened to him when he was younger. How has he not built up a tolerance? I then do something absolutely insane. I pull out a Gerber Mark II combat knife and give myself a haircut. This guy just doesn't play by the rules. I gather all the important things from my room, aka Playboy magazines, and head to the local motel. John Donovan and I come up with a plan to ally with the Haitian mob. Given that I just shot 50 or so of their soldiers, the plan seems well thought out. I commit a fatal hit and run to keep the blood pumping, and then visit a Haitian-owned voodoo store. I break in, but this lady just keeps undressing me with her eyes, and so I cap her and head upstairs. I chat with their leader, who happens to be the woman with the lazy eye makeup that was pretending to be held prisoner earlier at that church. What a plot twist, I guess. Anyway, we decide that we'll work together because a gentle shoulder touch moves the plot forward. I head back to John Donovan's motel room so that we can open a bottle of Merlot and cuddle, but he suggests I go and start cleaning up the neighborhood and taking back all of the businesses. The first business looks like a smack shack. The guys operating these venues are southerners, known as the Dixie Mafia, who work closely with the Marcano crime family. I proceed to fill them with lead and take back control of this beautiful little bed and breakfast. And by breakfast I mean smack, and by bed I mean smack. The biggest crime being committed here is that the Dixie Mafia reinforcements ran over a fire hydrant and are now wasting litres and litres of water. The saddest kind of collateral damage. 
The next business is a hotel which has also been turned into a giant smack shack. The pattern here is that everything is a smack shack. We're ethically above that kind of thing though. We engage in victimless crimes such as robbing banks. Kill Pocahontas, kill you there. I sneak around the back and shoot two soldiers who actually aren't soldiers, just guys wearing overalls. That's like wearing a red tracksuit and throwing up gang signs in South Central California, grow up. I clear out the hotel, taking back control for our side. It's at this point I notice something incredibly misleading. The neighboring waffle house is advertising the perfect waffle spelt in Scrabble letters which makes me want to vomit. The people sitting out the front don't look like they've just eaten the perfect waffle. I once said to my ex-girlfriend she was the perfect girl and she threw a lamp at me and said that was an impossible expectation for her to fill. The lamp was still plugged in and upon the power cord reaching its full tension, it swung back and hit her in the foot. The moral of the story is, don't say something is perfect around cracked out little mamas. Our next stop is taking back control of a nightclub. I open fire on everyone, even some of the clientele, which is probably a short-sighted business decision as they're about to become our customers. In fact, I think we're just giving this place straight to the Haitian mob, which seems tactically naive, but the silly goose crying makeup girl Pinky promised she'd be chill. I blast this guy in the head 18 times, but then realize you can only kill him with a quick time knife event because why not? Perla's nightclub is ours. The venue is now full of respectable citizens enjoying a classy night out. I mean, they're all just watching a dead drummer, but whatever people enjoy. It's now time to take back the final piece of the puzzle. The crown jewel of this neighborhood. The soup kitchen and church it's attached to. The girls, guns, heists, narcotics, it's all small time compared to this. This location is heavily fortified as the Dixie Mafia don't want to give up control of the homeless community's portion control. I make a call for guns to be delivered to my location. Would I have preferred the arms van not to be a vibrant red? Yes. Would I have preferred for it not to park in the middle of the road? Yes. We are now ready to make the streets run red with heavily watered down tomato soup. I slip in the back door like one in 17 Catholic priests do. I take them down with knives. I take them down with silenced pistols. I take them down with pump action shotguns. I then discover that this place is incredibly unethical even for the mafia. It's not a front for selling smack or girls, but something far worse, the devil's lettuce. These guys are selling wacky tobacco to homeless people to ensure they get the munchies and their soup kitchen always has business. This soup kitchen is at the center of the entire national underground organization that is the Italian American Mafia. I drive over to the Haitian leader's house and she's having a cute little date with a guy who knows where Richie Dasset is, aka the man who stabbed my stepbrother. It's time to get some sweet revenge, but first I want to play some dice games with these guys. Before the internet, people just did the most random activities to stay entertained. They refused to let me join and so I knocked them all unconscious with one punch each. Lincoln would make a fantastic 1960s husband. I drive to the swamps as Richie Dowsett is hiding at this flooded amusement park. I'm not sure why they thought building roller coasters in a swampland was the correct play. This reminds me of a funny story though. My little brother wouldn't stop tickling me when we were kids and so I drowned him. The game speed slows down and it rapidly cycles from day to night just like in real life. It definitely sets a spooky little atmosphere that's for sure. This mission is actually great. I put on a wife beater so I'm properly dressed for some revenge killing. The theme park has some pretty culturally insensitive rides and a few racially motivated and quite frankly hateful decorations, but ignoring that, it looks like a great place to spend a Saturday afternoon with the family. I reach the end of the haunted house and locate Richie Dowsett. I shoot him, but he's a tough cookie and eats more bullets than an American elementary school hall monitor. He seems sorry for murdering my stepbrother and so I give him an exciting carnival death. Lincoln proceeds to hang him from the ferris wheel so his final moments have a little flavor of fun which is really thoughtful. If you enjoyed this video hit like. I hope you all had a great Christmas and New Year's. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter, you won't regret it. I love you.